Welcome to SCBC WANA. This is our Good Friday service, um, and it's great to just, again, to be here with you all. As I, as I get into our message this evening, let me go ahead and open this up in a word of prayer. And so let's pray. Father, we come to you right now, and the Lord, as we open up your word, we will see why today is indeed called Good Friday. And I pray, Father, that our hearts will be open to, to see, Lord, the cross with, with renewed eyes, with eyes, Lord, that truly seeks your Son and that seeks you out, Lord. And so I pray, Father, for your Spirit to work in our hearts and that, Lord, tonight we will come to see why the cross is the cornerstone of our faith. And so it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Tonight is indeed Good Friday, and tonight we gather together to commemorate the cross of Jesus Christ. On this day, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was crucified so that he may save the world. I mean, that's a beautiful and wonderful statement right there. And yet, on this day, it is important for us to remember that Jesus indeed suffered. He suffered the crucifixion. He suffered the cross. He suffered death. And the suffering that Jesus experienced ranged from emotional distress to mental wrestling to public humiliation and finally to physical death itself. And what I want to do for us this evening is I want to embark on a journey to hear Jesus' heart. I want us to hear his thoughts, his, feel his emotions, to know our Savior. I mean, oftentimes when we talk about Jesus Christ, we talk about his death and his resurrection, we can brush over this aspect of Jesus' humanity. And, and, and yeah, Jesus is indeed, after all, the Son of God. He is fully divine in every way. He is by nature perfect and without sin. And yet, Jesus chose to become a man. He put on human flesh. He endowed, he endowed himself in human weaknesses so that he may experience firsthand what it means to be limited in his power, to be stuck within time and space, to be dependent upon food, water, clothing, sleep. Sometimes we just need to take some time to slow down and consider this and remember for a moment that when we, have, when we think about the cross, that a cross is indeed our salvation but the cross also comes with this human experience of pain, isolation, injustice, and depression. And so with that, I want us then to look at Psalm 22. Psalm 22. And if you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me there. I, I will have the slides as well up behind me, uh, the, the Bible verses as well. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to Psalm 22. And, and here in Psalm 22, we're going to see any an expression of Jesus' heart. The Psalms are indeed about the human heart. It's about how do believers, how do the saints of God walk with God in this fallen world. And the Psalms, they will demonstrate the trials and the joys that comes with that, that comes with being a faithful follower of God, and yet we walk in this corrupt and broken world. And so there's ups and downs in this type of life. And Psalm 22 then expresses that kind of humanity. Specifically expresses Jesus' heart as he is nailed to the cross. And we know this because on the cross, Jesus cries out the very first verse of this psalm. He breathed, when he breathed his last breath, he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which gives us a clue that the, this entire psalm indeed is about Christ. And so let us then draw in and let's come in and draw close to our Savior and hear, indeed, how his heart beats for us here. The psalm, Psalm 22, uh, is originally written by David. You can see that immediately in the inscription above. And yet, Jesus Christ, the son of David, is the ultimate fulfillment in the psalm. Every emotion, every thought that we're going to read and hear in the psalm is found in Christ as he faces his execution on the cross. And so while David is indeed the original author of the psalm, in this sermon, what I'm going to do for the purposes of Good Friday 
is I'm going to use Jesus as a subject of this psalm. The first point that we're going to see, first point we're going to see here is the predicament of a suffering man. Jesus here, right from the, right from the onset, he feels abandoned by God. He says here, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Jesus Christ here, he cries out. And he is, again, he is the son of God. And yet when he was born in human flesh, what he does, what he does here is he decides to say, that I no longer want, I don't, I don't consider the glory of the heavens a thing to be grasped is that he lowered himself. Jesus chose to lower himself by becoming one of us. And when he put on human flesh, Jesus, while he was still one with the Father, perfectly one in his humanity, he began to feel for the very first time a physical distance with him being on earth and God, his Father in heaven. And so imagine Jesus going, experiencing all this, and now on this final day, on this day of his death, Jesus here, he was stripped, he was whipped, he was beaten, he was spit on, mocked in every way. He was forced to carry his cross, his own torture device. Imagine just the pain that Jesus felt when the nails were driven into his hands. Imagine how alone Jesus was when he was raised up upon the cross and he hung there before all his enemies. It is no wonder why he cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? And yet Jesus continues to trust in God. In the very next verse, he says, yet you are holy and thrown on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted in you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and we're not put to shame. Jesus here, he's thinking back to God's faithfulness. He's thinking back to God's faithfulness, and he remembers how God has been faithful to his people all these years, and God has certainly been faithful. He heard Israel cry out to him in slavery, and what does he do? He rescues them. He delivers them from Egypt. David, King David himself, trusted in the Lord, and how many times has God saved David from countless a situation where he was facing impending death. Israel even cried out to God in, during exile, right? When they were exiled into a foreign land, they cried out to God, God heard them, and what does he do? He brings them back into the land. And so Jesus reflects upon God's faithfulness, and he leans upon that. I mean, certainly if God was faithful to Israel in the past, God would not neglect his own son, right, on the cross. And yet the agony of the current situation was so great. He, Jesus goes on, he says here in verse 6, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. He let him rescue him, for he delights in him. I mean, do you hear the sarcasm, the mockery that's coming to Christ, being thrown at Christ. Can you imagine again the pain that Jesus is going through here? It's overwhelming. I mean, reality here sets in. Jesus again in his thoughts, thinking, God, God, where are you? Yet I trust in you, but right now, the reality and re in, in, in this physical time and space, everything hurts. And Jesus feels even more alone. At this moment, there's no one by his side. Not his friends, not his people, not even God, his Father. I mean, Jesus wrestles with this in his heart. So it's the internal struggle of a sufferer, is it not? It's a predicament that we, are, we all face, that we all recognize, that when we're in a, such a hard place, and from the human eye, it looks like God has abandoned you. And yet in your hearts, you're constantly telling yourself, no, God is near, God is near. God, I trust in you, I believe in you. And you wrestle, don't you? You wrestle in those moments of trials. 
in your heart, you know that God is going to be faithful, but yet, in reality, the situation is so difficult. And it's this battle between the mind and the heart. I mean, we see that here. Jesus, again, goes back to remind himself of God's faithfulness. He says in verse 9, Yet you, God, are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you in my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. We see, really, in these first 10 verses, the predicament of a suffering man. It goes from crying out to God, asking him, why do you feel so far away from me, to trusting in God, as saying, I know you are with me. I know you are there. I know you are faithful. I mean, we go through all this, right? We oscillate back and forth. We hover from feeling alone in our grief to trying to hold on to the promise to God, and it's wrestling between how we feel and how we think. And oftentimes, if we're to be honest with ourselves, we will think that how we feel, sorry, how we feel and how we think are two contrary, two contrary experiences, forces battling with one another. All right, we think that on one hand, we know we're to trust in God, yet on the other hand, we're to grieve, and we think that these two are battling each other, but really, what this psalm is showing us, what Jesus is showing us is it's not. Jesus showed us that this is really just part of the human experience, that we are to grieve and trust at the same time, that both are true. And so here we see a predicament of a suffering man. The next section, though, will show us then the content of Jesus' plea, and here we see the plea of a suffering man. Starting in verse 11, we see here what Jesus prays for on the cross. He says here in verse 11, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Be not far from me. Jesus repeats that same cry in verse 19. He says, But you, O Lord, do not be far off. You, my help, come quickly to my aid. Jesus here, I mean, he's, again, facing an angry mob, a mob that's trying to crush him. They're mocking him. They're accusing him of blasphemy. They're sneering at his helplessness. And so he cries out to God. Jesus here, he describes the situation he's in. He describes the people around him, his, his accusers, his enemies. He describes them as dangerous animals. He says in verse 12, Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Basham surround me. They open their wide their mouths at me like a raving and roaring lion. And in verse, and then in verse 16, he says, For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. What we see here is that we see these animals. They're their pack. They travel together and they circle around their prey. And they're waiting for that opportune time to pounce. Jesus feels like that helpless prey at this moment. I mean, they struck him. They struck him. To be more specific, they crucified him. They crucified him. They nailed his hands and his feet to the cross. Verse 16, that second half of verse 16 says that they have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They nailed him. The mom nailed him for all to see. They gloat over him and his hanging body. They're laughing at his humiliation. And when it gets worse, they even strip him naked and stole all his clothes. It says here in verse 18, they divided my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. I mean, Jesus hung there on the cross. He hung there naked, couldn't cover himself at all. He was fully exposed, fully humiliated, and agonizing pain, and he's alone and dejected. This here we see is the physical pain that Jesus had to endure, and we do not take that for granted, right? We don't take for granted the, the suffering, the pain that Jesus had to go through on the cross. Jesus indeed suffered much physical pain. And yet in this psalm, we also see his emotional pain. In verse 14, 15, it says, Jesus says, I am poured out like water. 
and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a posturd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. I mean, have you ever felt such pain in your life? A time when you were, just, where it feels like your insides just melts away. You have no energy. You're sapped of any motivation. A time when the hurt becomes so unbearable, you shut down. You can't get out of bed. And you're out of sorts. You can't focus. You can't work. And you feel weak all the time. This is Jesus on the cross. And Jesus was betrayed by a friend. He was deserted by his disciples. He was tried by his own people. No one seems to believe in him. No one seems to listen. And most of all, during this entire time, God the Father remains silent. I mean, you may not have enemies like Jesus did at, at this time. You know, probably you don't have people breathing down your backs. But we do have our fair share of this kind of similar social pressure and anxiety, do we not? I mean, how many of you guys out there just feel the constant pressure and, 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 is, and is causing you to, to be discouraged, to be dejected, to feel like you question yourself and you're asking, why do I keep doing this? I mean, how many mothers out there feel like you can't measure up to other moms, that every time you see someone share about a craft they made, an activity they did, a meal hack on social media, you feel challenged in your parenting ability. How many fathers out there feel the pressure of being a good, hardworking employee to your manager, and yet a fun, loving, present father to your children, but also a doting and caring husband to your wife, and you need to be perfect at all of it. I mean, nobody tells you you need to be perfect, but you feel the pressure of having do, to do your best at all. How many singles here in this room feel the pressure to need to be in a relationship, to be dating, to find someone you can marry? I mean, this world constantly telling you that if you're single, something is wrong with you. How many of you guys feel the pressure as if there's something is indeed wrong with you? Or how many couples here, even in a church like ours, when we celebrate so many children and families and, and, and new births, but how many couples here struggle with conceiving? And even though you celebrate, it feels like there's a pressure upon you, and you're asking yourself, why, God, have you not blessed me? Where are you? Whatever your situation may be, however difficult or however hard it is, when you're stuck, oftentimes we are left wondering to God, why? Why do you have me here? Why do you feel so far away from me? Why have you forsaken me? And there's moments like these where all we want to hear is a voice from God telling us, I am with you, I am near. All you want is God to see your heart, to see your, your agony, to see how you're just trying to cling on faithfully to him and that he will indeed one day rescue you. I mean, that is exactly what Jesus here cries out for. He says to God, deliver my, my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. Jesus cries out, cries out in pain. This is the heart of Jesus. And with that now, I want us to turn to the actual narrative account of the crucifixion. So that when we have Jesus' heart and mind now, and we have what his, what's going on in his, in his mind, and his emotions, and his heart, now let us go to the cross. I don't have the narrative on the slides, and so you can follow me in your Bibles, or you can just listen with your ears. But in Matthew 27, we have here the account of Jesus' death on the cross, starting with verse 33. And it says, 
And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, and, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sapatani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge filled with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to, come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. This is the gospel right here. This is Jesus Christ in, his, in, in all his agony dying on the cross for us. Now the underlying question behind Psalm 22 and, this, and the crucifixion is this. Did Jesus die against his will? Because it sounds like that. It sounds like Jesus crying out to God, God, I don't want to be here. Why are you forsaking me? Why have you delivered me? Did God ignore his son here? No. You see, what we see here in the crucifixion is Jesus willingly took our place on the cross. Jesus became a man so that he could suffer and die on the cross as our substitute. He, Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf so that we may become the righteousness of God. And what that means is that on the cross, our sinless Savior bore our sins. He experiences the curse of sin. He bears the guilt and shame of sin, the humiliation of sin, the pain of sin, the deadliness of sin, and most importantly, the loneliness of sin. Jesus was forsaken not because he sinned against God. Jesus was forsaken because we sinned against God. And so when Jesus cries out to God here, is not an expression of him dying against his will. No, Jesus here is crying out to God because he's expressing him bearing the curse of our sin. I mean, Jesus Christ is not like us because he is indeed sinless. And yet in every way, what Psalm 22 shows us is that he is like us in every way because he experiences our human weaknesses, limitation, and pain. He experiences the curse of our sins. And so the reality is this. Psalm 22 is not written for us to sympathize with Christ. No, Psalm 22 is written to teach us that Jesus sympathizes with you. Jesus knows what you go through each and every day in our fallen hearts and in our fallen bodies. Now, Psalm 22, we only went through the first half of it. it. The second half actually ends with high praise to God because God indeed does deliver Jesus. In fact, at this, the, right on verse 21, we get this turning point where Jesus is indeed rescued. And we know that because on the third day, 
on Sunday is resurrection day. And Jesus rose from the dead. And come back on Sunday, you'll hear Pastor Kevin, he'll give us the good news. But what I want to end with tonight is with this. That indeed Jesus is alive today. And what he is doing is he is begging you to come to him. He's begging you to come to him, to lay down your sin, to repent, cast aside your weariness, to bring your guilt and shame before his throne of grace. Because Jesus is indeed gentle and lowly, and he knows your pain. And what Jesus is offering you in his death and in his resurrection, he's offering you to share in his joy and his praise. That if he was delivered, he was risen to life, you can experience that same life in him. A joy in knowing that God indeed is a savior. He is a rescuer. Come and put your trust in Christ and what he has done on the cross for your, on your behalf. The big idea for this evening's message is this. Jesus Christ suffers separation from his father so that we may experience God's abiding grace in our salvation. As we remember Good Friday, as we remember this day, is indeed only good because Jesus suffered, he bled, and he died for you on this day. If you are here with us this evening, and maybe you don't know Jesus, or perhaps you're here and you feel far from Jesus, and you're wrestling with your faith, I want to invite you to come and know Jesus, and come know his nail-pierced hands and his feet. Come know his shame and his humiliation. Come know his cry of agony, his, both his emotional pain and his physical pain. Come know him as he breathed his last breath, as he was forsaken on the cross, so that you may be able to draw near to him. Come know the joy that he has to offer in his suffering. Come know the joy that he has to offer in his abandonment. Come know the salvation that he has from your sins. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. If anyone who's here who does not know Jesus, I pray, Father, that he, they will come. They will come and know the pain, the suffering that you bore because of our sin. And I also pray, Lord, that they will then come to know the joy of forgiveness, the joy of grace, the joy of new life in Christ. Because on the cross, you have defeated our sin. Let us remember, Father, and commemorate this day. And let us, Lord, continue to give you all the praise and worship that you deserve. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.